I must say, I really like it that I'm not directly responding to Stoa videos, that I'm instead responding to Paul van der Klee's digestion of Stoa content. I find that, to me, much more palatable, I guess, as well. But um, in some sense, I think I would be much too brutish and, and harsh against uh, the Stoa speaker directly without being able to somewhat critique both Paul and the Stoa speaker in some sense. I must, okay, so let me get into it. Like, I mean, and again, this is, this is, this is like a weird backhanded thing for me to say, um, that is slightly embarrassing, I guess, because in some sense, like, I, I want to say that I don't appreciate the sociological metaphor. I really don't appreciate it, but it is, but I, but in de facto, it's useful to go to talk about the commons, but I do, I, I want to critique that as essentially, <clears throat> and I mean, I'll make up my own historical narrative around the commons as to why it is a stupid thing to do in some sense, and, and, and why it is actually, the whole thing is, is the wrong level. It, I mean, it's a useful metaphor in some sense. It's a very tangible external way of, of understanding the interior complication and the interior conundrum that is generating what we could call this kind of crisis but i think to look at it at this kind of sociological level as a sociological model or and metaphor and then also to import something from history something that in some sense okay well, well let, let me construct my historical narrative around the commons because i think that it was never as good as people think that it is that they're, they're somewhat mr uh, what's the word they, they are glorifying it in in a very fairy tale kind of way like the commons okay l l let's be very practical about this and and again i don't care about the practicality about this but i think it, it gets me it leads me to my point as to how this is actually all rooted within reasonableness itself within the layers of psychology and, and things like that within the internal interior spirituality and metaphysic or whatever because that's actually where we need to be having this discussion not with these weird kind of sociological interfaces and metaphors which are very much a waste of time and they indicate to us a solution which is a fake solution it is it is a false reduction so that's my general thesis and i have my my account of how to actually get th way through these 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 issues um so the reason why i, I deplore the use of the commons in this way is because it never existed in the way that it's being referred to the commons was the gift of the sovereign to the people and in some sense it was conserved by the sovereign and to a large extent people were cut off from making use of the commons to a large degree except for particular dispensations it was the king's law that you could go and take five birds from the commons a day or something like that you, you you were metered some use of the commons and in some sense there there was a general conservationist thing that was entrenched and enforced by the king's law and the king's good grace or whatever and and you know and different layers and levels of nobility could perhaps also sub sub um manage you know uh, essentially the use of the commons but I mean, to a large extent, you know, when in, when the king was feeling, I don't know, uh, or, or whatever, that people would essentially perhaps be cut off, that you weren't allowed to, um, what's the word, hunt in the king's land or something like that. You you, you weren't allowed to, to take big game from the commons. Um, so in some sense, you could say that it de facto forced people to live in a shared moral environment a shared medium in some sense of norms and this is to a large extent what feudalism was all about and and what civilized europe in, in the sense that everyone had to live under the same rubric and therefore you wouldn't have these pockets of folklore and these pockets of demagoguery and sort of witchcraft or, or, or just fairy tales and sort of essentially de facto cult belief structures and things like that that would just creep out of the woodwork because everyone was equally suppressed by the same sort of very materialistic form of when i say materialistic i mean embodied form of morality that essentially if you spoke against the king that was treason treason and the and the 
the punishment for treason was that you know you your nose would be cut off and then you would be drawn and quartered you know so it's like that that you would be your face would be disfigured in the process of the execution because everything then had this very much embodied moral resonance that you could you could oh when you spoke treason your nose was liable to be d dispatched from your face you know so it, it's like it's this idea that everyone is living under the same uh, system in some sense so you have this kind of de facto um, systematized uh, 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 cultural reality and in some sense the thing that is providing that reality to you is the might of the sovereign which is essentially the de facto representative of god in flesh in 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 terms of his divine majesty and so the order the king's order is 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 uh, what allows for even the commons to even function so the commons never functioned in in an egalitarian way it functioned according to the uh, uh the divine right of kings in some sense and in some sense it was paid for by the king by the the human the humanitarian project which royalty was meant to um be a part of of promulgating which was essentially that nobility it it for meritorious service to the realm that you would be promoted that that you could be ennobled that that you could join the peerage for for that that, that your house your your lineage it, for noble service for, for for a great act or something like that that you could be given title and lands and that you would join the nobility and that was the project of royalty was to grow the nobility as it were um it 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 was essentially it was a kind of spiritual breeding program or something like that the idea that essentially people you know once once a noble family it's meant to kind of conserve its own spiritual efficacy or something like that but but that was somewhat the that was the 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 pact that, that was the cultural settlement of of the moral schema at least in in christendom in some sense that that was what um that essentially fate if 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 it was in your stars if it was in your uh you, you know that uh if you were a great poet perhaps you 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 might be knighted or something that you know um anyway anyway uh something like that no so i i the commons did it ever really function you know the tragedy of the commons famously or whatever w without without in some sense some elite in society holding the commons in trust and somewhat managing the commons for the general use of people at large which in some sense perhaps can only be protected through some kind of soft power but also through some kind of soft largesse that that the, the the trustees would have been fu funded by by um, by the local elite essentially to to maintain um, and conserve the efficacy of 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 the um, let's say latent value th th that the commons was uh, uh, purveying to to the society uh, attached to it or, or something like that. Um, so w l let me just move on to the heart of the matter w what actually happened in western society what really happened in western society was that our elites lost their function because the state displaced them in some sense so charity was displaced by welfare by by status programs in some sense F in the biggest shift was really when after world war ii perhaps it was even after world I, I think it was world war ii the state said if you're indigent and you cannot afford a burial the state will bury your body whereas before that used to be taken care of by the local parish by the local church they would have to essentially deliver paupers burial a, a, a paupers burial service or something like that and that was somewhat the soft sacred trust that culture and society that 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 you you didn't have a nanny state that was going to sort of 
wipe the snot from your nostrils and 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 pull you up by by your breeches or something like that and so essentially th there was no there was no outside help that that could be expected you had to rely on your neighbors to some degree and then essentially the responsibility of elites somewhat had to factor into the cultural drama had to factor into to the cultural synthesis or something like that that has all since been displaced by essentially the in, the entitlements and the expectation that the state must provide the state must do something something must be done and the state is 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 the one that that must uh, do this and essentially the the problem is of course that the state is prone to being captured by entrenched interests and essentially politics because it essentially can devolve into a blame game and essentially because journalism is prone to not being let's say accountable to being truthful or something like that it can just peddle narrative or whatever when you combine these systems you end up with essentially a kind of uh, a wild goose chase of, of where does the buck stop in some sense and in some sense uh, uh, the buck is constantly in circulation because you've got all of these systems which are not aligned in law at some point to in a hard structural way to very clearly put the onus onto a very particular institution or a very particular expectation as being untoward as being unreasonable or something like that so we have cultivated a toxic cultural political climate and, and perhaps also a, a sense-making journalism sort of uh, um, institutional um, gatekeeper or whatever uh, is is part of this corrupt institutionally corrupt circus essentially now in the midst of that kind of hydralisk in, in the midst of that kind of um, confusion and, and convoluted set of of insoluble uh, perniciousness and and you know I mean, you can average this out to a lot of things that in some sense you, you get perhaps corrupt elites and you get revolutionary people at the bottom, both colluding against the middle of society to just kind of perpetuate the narrative in which you can always use the latest revolutionary trend in order to allow the plutocrats to virtue signal their way out of yet more political malfeasance and economic treachery or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so, I mean, that, that I think is, is the modern conundrum to some degree. And, and to then sociologically harp about, oh, well, we need to get back to the commons or something like that. Now, let me talk about what's actually missing in this, in this picture. What's missing in this picture, um, to a large degree, is that the only p solution in the American system is politics. And you have to go to get into politics, you have to get through the sense making apparatus, you have to pierce the media, um, the, 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 the cartel of information and false information or whatever, or peddling narrative or whatever. But in a better society, you would actually have the courts to do something with. But you can't do that in the American system, because the American system, quite frankly, does not have the rule of law. You are not guaranteed laws of general application. You are only guaranteed due process and equal protection under the law, but you're not guaranteed laws of general application. And so you naturally are prone to identity politics, essentially, because it's perfectly valid within that democratic system that you have there, um, which is quite disgusting, I, I will say as well. But essentially, whenever you are before a judge, which is in some sense, there are no proper, there are no real judges in America. They are all magistrates. And I'm saying this relative to my legal tradition and my legal system, because all of your judges are creatures of statute. They, they are there to rationalize and to make sure that all the legislation, legislation is merely consistent and in conformity and with itself and, and with the things that it needs to be read in, in, uh, uh, in alignment with whatever. They are, they are glorified secretaries. They, they cannot, um, and, and the form of the law that they're trying to rationalize and, and make consistent is whatever the legislature wants to do, or the Congress or the Senate or the state Congress and the Senate, you know, they're just adding to this bank of, of things. And there's nothing you can do as an individual citizen to challenge uh, 
the frame of the law other than if there is a, a state constitutional right or a federal constitutional right of which there are frankly almost no federal constitutional rights. I mean, apart from essentially the right to due process or something like that, there are no substantive rights in the American system uh, because there are no very, there are no clear remedies for any of those rights because there are absolute rights. And so they're just rationalized as not being infringed. You know, it, it's, it's just a, they, they are basically political rhetoric. You, you can't say, you know, I don't want to pay my income tax because that is actually infringing on my right to pursue happiness. You, you know what the judge will say? The judge will say, no, taxation is, a is, is necessary for a legitimate government purpose and it's rational. Therefore, your right to pursue happiness is not being infringed. In fact, it's being enhanced by the fact that we are taking income tax from you. That's, they just rationalize it. The, the right has no clear remedy. It's not a right. The, without a remedy, there is no right. So it's political rhetoric. It's there to be part of the political con contestation that essentially, if you feel like your rights are being infringed, then some political party or political campaigner will say, I'm going to deliver to you your rights. They, they can only be defended politically because essentially your legislative body is your moral authority in society. And this is what I would generally call the Napoleonic corruption. I've spoken about it in a lot of my recordings. Um, and, you know, this is what happens when you create a state in the image of the French Revolution because you rebelled too soon. Um, you know, historical inheritance of... And, and, and this is why America really deserves the identity politics degradation of their society and culture, because when the social justice warrior loses in a court case, the judge doesn't say you're being unreasonable. The judge doesn't say what you want is, is against principles and morality. The judge, the judge only says you don't have enough political power yet to make me rule in your favor. You know, that's the kind of moral pluralism that exists in the American system. And in some sense, you could say, well, this is because you've had too much strange influence from abroad and things like that but i would actually say no the 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 cracks in the american system the constitutional deficiency in the american system is now finally come home to roost it's now finally manifest and i, I don't think that you'll be able to put this genie back in the bottle i mean it is true that identity politics is a intellectually bankrupt you know proto-fascist you know somewhat um you know uh, uh pernicious form of, of groupthink and and such. But there is a problem that the American system only has political ways of countering this. It, it, it doesn't have, the citizen doesn't have a way to, to protect themselves from this kind of pernicious, um, and, and that, that is a legal failing, I would say, in the legal system itself. The legal structure in America um, is, is, not, is not fit for a republic. The, the, the citizen of the republic is denigrated, has no integrity, because they are morally dictated to by the legislature, essentially. Um, anyway, uh, this has eventually metastasized into the modern contemporary crisis, which is being broadcast all over the world, which in some ways deserves to be broadcast into continental Europe, because continental Europe has the same Napoleonic corruption, because continental European law has much the same defects that the American legal system has. Britain should perhaps have more resilience against it. Um, in some sense, I think that the only reason why they're not more politically proactive is because now they don't have friends overseas anymore. Uh, because Trump is, is, well, at the moment, uh, Britain is, is acclimating itself in the anticipation of a Joe Biden presidency. And they have probably been signaled pretty heavily that uh, they have to, re you know, I, I mean, you know, in some sense, uh, uh, Britain is, is not a free power. It, it exists within a certain context. Um, and it's not a big boy as it used to be, and it has to fall in line with, with the big players, as it were. Um, and who knows what Joe Biden has already uh, signaled to, to, to Boris. And I, I, I don't know why people don't talk about this this much in the British media, that essentially uh, uh, Britain is not um, 
a flagrantly independent power. It ha does have to deal with geopolitics, and I think that this is a large component of what's going on in, in Boris Johnson's reorientation, as it were. Anyway, that's, um, I'm sure British people, uh, I'm sure Americans don't care about British politics. Um, I'm South African anyway. Um, I mean, I'm disgusted by the fact that we have legal scholars from America that come here and teach our judiciary your poisonous, pathetic legal tradition where we then become prone to the same silly, problematic, constitutional, you know, sort of upheaval that you've got brewing in your culture, which I would say that you deserve to some degree because your, your structure, your legal structure is not fit for purpose. You do not have the rule of law in America. Um, you, you, the substantive law in America is trial and error. The, the American citizen is a lab rat, there to be subject to whatever expert testimony can be proffered or something like that. And, and this is why um, there is very little protection. I mean, in some sense, you could say perhaps there, there are punitive, uh, you know, that, that you can extract your pound of flesh maybe if, if you if you hang in there for long enough and, and you and you stay in there for 30 years and you promulgate your case and you somehow manage to exhaust the um uh you know because i mean this is the problem it's, it's very hard to 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 get a win um in in a system in which you have this procedural due, due process and people that have more money than you essentially can exhaust you or at least um defer your claim for so long that you know they can perhaps outlive your ability to to continue to um litigate uh especially when you're going up against corporations that have uh a continuity of uh, and they can also re reposition their their holdings as well and, and mergers and acquisitions and things like that anyway anyway um what's the point uh so okay so oh what am i talking about so so what what is the real commons that we should care about and that actually produces something that are like the commons the real commons the thing that we need to be able to share is we need to be able to have a certain kind of contest of values we need a mechanism of justification Th this is that's what justice means in practice. It means we need to be able to work out who is justified about the claims that they're making and who is unjustified. And that is something that is uh, an embodied... It's not something that you can see on the face of something. It's something that requires a certain practice, a certain negotiation, or a certain exchange and engagement of values and, and somewhat interrogation or... or uh, anyway... Um, an active form of, of negotiation, which is often what happens in my legal tradition in terms of the pleading process of the high courts, is that the parties will plead their cases until they perfectly replicate each other's pleadings, and then the trial can begin. Um, and then you already have, let's say, a, a script in principle of the, the positions in principle of both sides, and then Obviously, the, the questions of fact and the questions of, of establishing and evidencing uh, uh, which cases, because in some sense, they've already in principle agreed upon, um, let's say, the, the, the play by play. The, um, it, they're probably better legal minds than me, I guess, uh, uh, that would be able to explain this much more fluidly. But essentially, it's as if you said, um, you were choreographing a chess match before playing the match and you just talked it out, but you did it somewhat in the abstract. You did it and you said, okay, well, I, I start by, um, you know, uh, uh, opening my, my king's flank side or something like, I don't know, you know, you, you just kind of abstractly play by play, talk it out, but, you know, you don't know actually where, it was slightly vague as to where the actual pieces are going in some sense, but, but there are, um, the whole thing has been choreographed in some sense. And then, and then it becomes a question of execution in terms of actually, um, 
substantiating those headings of argument uh, that are laid out in the pleadings. Um, and you put the other side to terms in your pleadings, which is which is very useful because essentially, um, you know, w w when they give you pleadings that you're not happy with, essentially, you know, you you, you contest them. You say this is vague and embarrassing. You know, like what what is what what claim are are are, are you making here? Um, and so you force the other person to sort of flesh out. The case or, or, or to make claims or claims in the alternative and so you've got all the kind of you've got it hashed out in, into and obviously it's not nice when the other person just merely tries to dispute absolutely everything that that ends up actually producing certain defects in in the trial itself when, when because you know when one party just literally tried to dispute absolutely everything um they end up with essentially uh when they try to when they try to litigate their case um with quite embarrassing uh uh defects because essentially the things that they disputed therefore um they're not really capable of claiming them as as being definitive in their case because essentially you know they they they, they why why were they ambiguous in the pleadings but then in in the trial they try to be uh, um specific uh, uh um about the the form in which their case uh, uh, is is striving to to um, manifest itself or and, and, and express itself, and so people are are bound by their pleadings, and so there is a level of principle. This is also only possible when the substantive law is clear enough and let's say permanent enough, in some sense, that it's not just the fiat of the legislature that is describing the form of the law. Um, that the jurisprudence and the substantive leg of the of, of the law itself is already in principle complete um which is as far as i can tell only in existence in the roman dutch law that that my legal tradition has inherited which no longer exists in continental europe because napoleon destroyed it it doesn't even exist in holland and the netherlands anymore um Anyway, uh, and and it, it has also been improved, I would say, by being ensconced and encapsulated within the common law as well, because there were nice principles in the common law, which essentially just, uh, so, so in some sense, in my legal tradition, we actually have a common law system, but the core of the common law is the Roman Dutch substantive law. So we have this marvelous mixed system here in South Africa. And the constitution as well is also marvelous, although it has been completely corrupted by these legal scholars from America that, that have come and given their poisonous uh, uh, advices and counseling to, to uh, um, these people who very clearly seek to betray the constitutional values and to uh, uh, allow for a level of institutionalized corruption which has uh, damaged uh, uh, both culture, but also economically and also politically, the new South Africa, which essentially lies betrayed and stabbed in the back and, and quite frankly, dead. The question is, can it be resurrected at this point, and which I think will also take quite a lot of other measures. We will have to remove these race and gender studies professors and academics from being publicly funded to spew their proto-fascist ideology and to corrupt young minds with this disgusting form of sociological morality and, the, and this dehumanizing identity politics project of... of uh, um... Anyway, these are things that in law should already be covered by the South African legal tradition. It, to some degree, the reason why it's not covered is because essentially we have been inclined to follow these, these very loudly broadcast cultural trends that America has been projecting all over the world or, or, or somewhat broad, you know, the, 
the, the noxious cultural war, which does belong in America, I think, to some degree. Um, and I would even say continental Europe as well. Uh, anyway, I've, I've somewhat veered off my topic, but not far by much, actually. So what is really the commons? The commons is, is that we need to be able to stand firm to say that we need to be able to derive a justification for things. We, we cannot just make rationalizations. We actually have to be justified in our understanding. So whether something is rational or not is not good enough. We need to say that our values come together into an understanding and that our understanding is justified. That doesn't mean that it's perfect. That doesn't mean that it can't make mistakes. It just means that the errors... It's not going to be erroneous in, in its own thinking. It might be incomplete and therefore prone to mistakes, but there's going to be no overt erroneousness um, in its functioning. You know, the, the kinds of mistakes that it'll make might be because of unknown unknowns in some sense. Uh, but that's not for want of responsibility. That's not for want of accountability. Um, This requires a certain hard structure. This requires a certain craft and art of, you could say, culture and law or something like that. But in some sense, I would say that you need the legal update first and then the culture follows second. Um, the culture, I mean, a culture will conform over time to, let's say, the common sense and respect which the law inculcates in terms of how it really empowers people to see clear moral thinking functioning uh, uh, within their society. Um, when essentially morality becomes something that is um, accessible in, in a, in a, um, in a fora where essentially, I mean, the high courts in my country have universal jurisdiction in terms of substantive law. They don't have universal jurisdiction in terms of geography, but in terms of the issue that can be raised at a high court, there is no issue that cannot be raised in a high court. You just need to have a valid action. But essentially, there is no question that the court cannot consider. The court can reject an application uh, for something because it can you can say that no this issue is is not justiciable because it's moot it's not relevant it's not pertinent to anything it's hypothetical or it's not ripe because it's a very hard thing to describe ripeness but basically that is just it's it's not ready it, it hasn't manifested yet in a in a in a case uh, or in a form in which um the court can address it because perhaps uh, an event is going to happen and then it will sort of uh, uh, be more amenable to, to um, I can't remember the the, uh, the description of ripeness. It, it's, it's quite an ephemeral kind of thing in some sense. But um, it has to do with, with there being a chance... Um, to have more factors in in the legal question or, or something like that um, in order to 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 create a judgment uh, uh, or, or or to address the circumstances of the case in in a more robust uh, uh, form anyway it is a very hard thing to define ripeness, and I'm I'm just I'm grasping somewhat in in my memory of when I was taught this stuff. But um, uh, to be justified in one's understanding, you know, in, in some sense, uh, the understanding of society to some degree it, it can be regarded as an arbitrary structure because it's going to be a culmination of um, of many, many different factors, and which ones should be salient, which ones should be morally salient. And so, in some sense, the justification in, let's say, morality that can 
that is amenable to being recognizable in law gives us a certain edifice upon which not everything is covered. Taste is not covered, perhaps. And, and essentially, let's say, the, the, the vicissitudes of, of culture, um, the vicarious nature of moral judgment that does not resound uh, uh, up to the level of justiciable um, rebuke or, or declarative um, uh, findings that a court might make. I mean, by the way, you, you can apply for the High Court to make a declarative order on a certain matter of law, but you can't uh, try to get the court to condescend uh, to some essentially uh, uh, you know, an issue which is not legally pertinent, you know, the, 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 that is de minimis juris lex, that, that is, is beneath the, um, it, it, it is a trifle to a court of law, that is a trifling matter in, in a court of law, um, which is, this is quite funny, because that's exactly what was being used against President Trump uh, when he was, uh, w when essentially uh, the, the Democrats infused um, Congress uh, impeached him. Uh, I mean, that was essentially a de minimis juris lex kind of claim. I mean, it, it was essentially completely fabricated out of a hypothetical uh, uh, legal argument in some sense. And, and, you ha and you had to literally just wholesale buy into that theoretical contention. I mean, it, it's sort of guilt by interpretation. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh... Anyway, uh, uh, that, that's a bit of a... Uh, quite a complicated matter, and I, I'm not going to relitigate that out, but I do have a, a recording somewhere in my, on my YouTube channel where, where I address that, that particular case. But... Um... But yeah, they're, they're very interesting uh, axioms within the Roman, uh, Roman Dutch legal system. I mean, I would say the most important one would be um, the Ordi Alta, Ordi. Partem alterem. Uh, did I say it right? Is it Audi alterem partem? Uh, I think it's Audi alter. Oh, I got. The... It's a dead language, Latin, and I obviously don't say it correctly. But um, the other side must be heard, which I would say in English is is better derived as justice must be seen to be done. It's it's it's, it's not worth anything to say justice must be done. But justice must be seen to be done, because if it is not seen to be done, if it's not transparent enough, then it might as well not be done. So the decorum of the court and, and the clarity of the law itself means that you cannot have the substantive law being trial and error. You have to have a permanent principled basis to substantive law. Uh, Otherwise, essentially, your substantive law is not a general law of application. It's there to be changed whenever the legislature feels like it wants to change it. This is not good enough. There is no protection for the individual against the leviathan of the state legislature. This is inexcusable. This is not civilized. This is the rule of man. This is not the rule of law. You cannot define the rule of law as due process. That's not good enough. Then essentially you're just saying that people that have the money to, to follow every procedural potentiality can essentially exhaust all of their uh, uh, uh. I mean, this is why America is the playground of the rich to some degree as well, and also why it's on a moral level is so prone uh, to to 
uh, and and also why the government then is uh, and there's always a political solution being sold because the individual citizen does not have the ability to extract justification from the form that the law has taken in some sense because there's no body of law that filters the legislative um uh i'm just trying to think of a, of a poetical metaphor but the, the legislative um manufacture uh of 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 legal instruments and and oh that's that's the wrong term of 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 legal devices and legal structures and 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 legal implements and and regulation that regulation can exist side by side with already law that is essentially settled in principle um you know th there's a lot that can still be legislated uh, you know, in terms of, of trying to just promote p the public good or something like that, or, or, or trying to give some effect to social norms and things like that. But, um, you know, the, the principled wedge of the law uh, uh, must be able to cut through the, the regulation uh, when it's inconsistent, when, when it's principally unsound. But there are no principles, in some sense, in the American legal system because their rights are absolute and they have no remedies attached to them. Um, you know, it's an all-or-nothing approach. Either the right is rationalized as not being infringed or, um, or something is, is cut away as being invalid. And then, in some sense, it's very hard to do that because when you invalidate certain structures... You know, perhaps if you even validated state constitutions or you invalidated state legislature, then you've kind of got, well, how do you remedy that? You know, you, you've got a, a bigger welt of a constitutional crisis now because you've got this lacuna in the structure of the law itself. Um, but I mean, I guess you could say that, that that's the kind of society that they wanted to create. They wanted to create a society that is completely politically self-directed. So it just means that essentially all your rights are forfeit if you don't stay vigilant and keep on voting for the right party, essentially. That, that is, you know... Um, which, you know, I mean, it's not... It's not as if there is nothing... You know, I, I guess you could say that the American system is alive with some stark level of um, you know, uh, that if good people don't organize and stay vigilant and perhaps create grassroots political um, Anyway, you know, it's, it's not, it's not that great that I'm commenting on, on a foreign, in some sense, I, I care more about my country and I care more about the untoward influence that America has had on my country in corrupting its legal system by following its very bad example. Um, and I do think that there is a lot to be learned about my legal system that would fix, I mean, there are NGOs, uh, I, I think there's an NGO, uh, I can't think of the exact name, I think it's something like the Society for Law Reform, but it, it very particularly tries to proselytize, essentially, Roman Dutch substantive law, I think it's, it's like a South African-based NGO, and it tries to hearken other people to um, improve their legal structure, uh, Anyway, obviously South Africa could be a better example, but in some sense I think that we are more prone to political corruption than we are actually to legal corruption. Although the legal system is corrupt, it is, I would say, a symptom of the political malfeasance more so than the converse, that the, there was political corruption first and then legal corruption 
institutionalized corruption mirroring that political corruption after that uh, uh, so in america i think it might somewhat be the opposite that the political corruption if i mean this is a conspiracy theory but to the degree to which someone would think that there is political corruption in america i think that it is a symptom of the lack of the hard structure of the legal system anyway um So, you know, I guess it's weird that I'm talking about justification, I'm talking about understanding things, and, and, and then I'm talking about legal structures so much. But I do think that uh, that's where it's all based, to some degree. Um, and I, I do think that talking about the commons might be a way that other people can connect with it conceptually, but I do think that, quite frankly, it's just to conv it, it convolutes the point and it actually gets us further away from actually solving the real problems that essentially we we we, we share a moral commons we have if we don't share a morality and this is why i don't like talking about the commons because the only reason why the commons even existed was because there was an authoritarian de facto um state that was uniformly regulated by essentially the mythology of the divine right of kings and essentially which entrenched this idea of nobility. So essentially people could orientate themselves to, let's say, this hierarchy of nobility in some sense and moral moral standing. And, and that, you know, somehow if the stars aligned for you that you could also join the peerage, um, that you could be a peer in the realm. Um, But, you know, we, we have to recognize the kind of gen cultural degeneration that we have in society, um, which is somewhat a, a reflection of the structural deficiencies that were there. But I, I just, just uh, there was a pop song by Lord, L-O-R-D-E, that female pop artist. Was it, uh, what was one of the lines? We don't want to be royals. It's not... Uh, We don't want to be royals, you know. So in, in, in the Jungian sense, these are people who, who maybe have even seen the drowning king in, in the cave. Um, who promises that whoever will re rescue the sovereign in, in the underworld, uh, he will place into his right hand the, the morning star. Uh, these are people that are not interested in that kind of mystery, you know. These are people who are happy to be in Keegan stage three, as it were. And maybe they do need than to be restricted in terms of COVID. Maybe they do need to be infantilized because that's the level on which that they operate. And they need to know that they are somewhat uh, toddlers in a, you know, it, it's, it's a bit of a, um, it, it's one thing to allow people to masquerade as independent adults who are, supposedly being responsible but and it's another thing to um to show to them how they aren't or how the rubber meets the road or something like that so i do think that even though i'm appalled with all these modern brave new world big brother tactics i also think that it it provides a tremendous opportunity for um getting to grips with uh, uh, the lack of justification, the, la the lack of understanding uh, that people inhabit uh, so that they can know that essentially they don't attain to these high lofty ideals or at least uh, uh, they can at least witness the absence of orientation to these goals or something like that. You know, their, their inability to affect... I mean, I do think there are people that have the right estimations on this, in America, for instance, that, um, you know, it's, it's not so much as that they, they wouldn't wear a mask, but they don't like being told that they must wear a mask. I think that there's something quite correct in that, that they should, they should be informed that it's good to wear a mask, and they're not told that they have to do so. Um, 
that is how it should be done in some sense. And when it's not done in that way, they are right to, to somewhat know that they are being spoken to out of turn, that essentially government is not, is not your better. Government is your secretary, is the secretary of the people to promote the public good. It's not a warden. You are not the ward of your government. We, we have somewhat lost sight of this, quite disgustingly. Um, and the people who chair it on are the people who like to think from the sociological perspective that everything would be better if people would just get in line with the program being doled out uh, because of the narrative and the, and the hysterical panic that they've somewhat bought into because of all these perverse, I guess this is going to sound like conspiracy theory, but you know, uh, the carbon the carbon cycle, global warming panic, you know, using computer models where the people who actually invented those computer models say that they're being misused and this is a bunk field, essentially. This is a field that is being politically contrived. Um, also, you know, the vegetarians or the vegans that don't want us to eat any meat because it's supposedly bad for the environment, but they won't go and investigate regenerative agriculture in which you actually need large herds of of uh, cattle or, or some kind of grazing um, uh, uh, pe pecos or uh, I don't even know the Latin term um, hooved thing uh, But anyway, it's um, <sighs> yeah, well, I've only listened to fifty five minutes or so of this one hour and fifty minute video, so. Listen to uh, it's one hour and oh that's strange oh it's because I'm looking at his red bar of the Jordan thing anyway yeah okay so I've only listened to half of this basically anyway I guess I'll stop this recording and I'll watch the rest before I upload this Okay, this might be a reiteration or an emphasis, but just to tie together what I was saying about the sociological reductionism, which is not useful or whatever, but essentially there is a sociological fault in the legal structure of America, essentially, which is that, again, like, this is a pretty good general... Look, I understand that these things are generalizations to some degree, but they, this is actually a pretty faithful generalization, I would say, is that an American judge is not really you don't really get high court judges. Uh, they're called high courts, but essentially they're just magistrates because they're creatures of statute or, or within the framework of, of these things. And what I mean by that is that they are there scanning for legitimate government purposes that are viable within legislative or state constitutional or federal constitutional framework. Um, and they're just checking for consistency within those frameworks and they are just that's what they're policing and so they're saying is this a rational um is this a legitimate government purpose and is it rational and that's all they're doing that, that that's what a judge in america does essentially they check for those two things they don't ask is the legitimate government purpose justified they cannot ask that because the only thing that makes it justified is the the product and the manufacture of yet more never-ending substantive law that comes out of the legislature um, or, or that has already been let's say inculcated within the constitutional frameworks of either either the state constitution or the federal constitution which is problematic because the rights there are or at least in, in the federal case in the federal constitution the rights are palpably weak because they don't have actionable remedies attached to them and the substantive law in america is let's say 
contextualized and recontextualized by the fiat, the legislative fiat to create yet more products, let more, yet more legal uh, Napoleonic kinds of regulation and code and such. And so the substantive law in America is trial and error. So there is no rule of law in America. There's only due process, which is not... It, it, it's, it, so you can't go against powerful people because they'll just exhaust you in terms of the process. And you don't even have the substantive implements that you might hope for in order to stand up against the state. Because the state just, the judge just needs to rationalize that it's a legitimate government purpose and that the exercise of that government purpose was rational within the framework. So you, on moral grounds, you have no independence as a citizen of the republic. The, the citizen of the republic essentially has no integrity against the might of the Leviathan of the, of the legislative house, which has a kind of Napoleonic moral dominion. Uh, uh, and, and so there is no dignity in the American system for the individual um, because the law itself, the substantive wing of the law is trial and error. And this is a relic from your history. This is a relic because you created a constitution 300 years ago, which is why, or however long it was, in the image of the French Revolution, which is why you knew you didn't know what you were doing to the extent to which that all the Bill of Rights all, all the proper rights or whatever are in the amendments they're not in the body of the constitution because they're trash because you knew that they were trash and they end up essentially just being political rhetoric so you have this legal system which is essentially the playground of of power players and and the and politicos and journalism and because the, there's no there's no way that the individual can actually in in some sense look there are, look, there are, it's not as if the system is complete, look, the system is deficient, but it's not like, in terms of historical times, it's not, it's not an evil system, you know, it, it's really quite brilliant for its time, as it were, and in some sense, there is an escape hatch, which is that if you are being prosecuted by the state, then at least you could have a jury trial, which essentially can't change the law, they can't argue against the legislature, they can't strike the let the judicial proceeding is not going to lead to the invalidation of some law, but essentially the jury trial means that they can at least protect one of their fellow citizens from, let's say, an, a morally egregious overreach from the state. So essentially you, you, your peers can essentially let you off the hook. But that's not justified in some sense. When I, when I say that, when I, say that I'm, I mean that in a vague way. When I say that's not justified, it's like you don't actually... It, the law doesn't refine itself. So it doesn't, you know, th this is like, oh yeah, we see that there's something wrong with how the legislature framed this and, and, and how things are conducted. And we're going to basically let you escape from the ravages of this law. But I mean, that's, you know, it's, okay, you see what I'm kind of describing. It's substandard in some sense. Oh, so... So you can beg your fellow peers, your fellow citizens of the Republic to let you off. And I think you're not even allowed to appeal for that directly. You can't actually, well, in certain states, you can't make that kind of argument overtly. They have to, essentially, the, 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 jurors, uh, the jurors have to, uh, I mean, it, it depends perhaps on which state. Different states will have different procedural kind of things where essentially... You know, the, the, the lawyer can't just make a naked plea that essentially abandon the law, the law is corrupt, defy it. M please, Mr. Jurors, like, send a message, as it were, to the legislature. But my point is, is that you shouldn't be sending messages back and forth to the legislature because the judge, him or herself, should be able to have a stable, substantive wing of the law that essentially then can have an updated legal test attached to it. And in some sense... What the legislature then does when it creates new laws, it's creating public good, it's creating structures that can help coordinate energies within society, but it's not prescriptive on the legal side, but it can try to fix law, it, it can, because some, sometimes legal jurisprudence can have problems, because essentially judges don't have publicity for the new decisions that they make, and in some sense, when you start getting cases that keep on recurring in the same field, it's in some sense, because, you know, 
the law might be fine and just, but essentially people need to be made aware of it. You know, you, you, you need certain people need to be informed about how the law works. You know, this is this was the function of, of a civics education to some extent as well, so that people could orientate themselves and in their in their um uh, in in their manage in, in their self management and planning, you know certain common law principles of you know being able to mitigate one's own losses and things like that. Uh, sort of you know a, a culture of responsibility and self determinism, as it were. You know the, the, that it's not just rights that you have, but they they also come with corresponding, let's say, obligations. And, and in some sense, those obligations mean that essentially you are going to be judged against a reasonable man in, you know, in, in many cases, in many cases that, that have to do not with, let's say, um, you know, let's just say that there are, there are problems that can be caused by people because of a, a legal omission or a, a legal acts of omission, that essentially they did not act directly to contravene the law, but they indirectly contravened the law because they omitted to take the proper care in certain circumstances. And, you know, in some sense, you know, the way to get out of that is either because you are young, you're inexperienced or something like that. But, you know, at, at some point, uh, um, it is required in a culture to say ignorance of the law is no excuse to some degree. At some point, you know, it's like, you have to, uh, uh, you know, society has to sort of bootstrap at some point, because otherwise um, you get these perverse incentives uh, and, and you know, and it, it actually blaming people for acts of omission is part of the solution of making the, the clarion siren call for, for greater um, cohesion and such. You know, and this is also how law becomes settled law, but also how and settled law can be properly explored and expounded upon and then perhaps adapted or evolved or, or fought against because essentially sometimes law does need further elaboration, it does need further exploration because human interactions are complex things and modern contexts are changing and blah blah blah. And in some sense this is the point of code and culture or something like that that Jordan might be talking about um, Jordan uh, Hall. I don't know what he actually goes by now. Jordan Green Hall or, or Jordan Hall. Um, but uh, so, yeah. Um, what else should I say about this? There's not that much more to say. Um, And social norms, social mores, are such an important integral aspect of, uh, at least in the Roman Dutch substantive law, it's a huge part of it in some sense. Although I would say that this poisonous ideology of identity politics is so antithetical to even substantive law, in some sense, it, it kind of at base demands that everyone have to live in this mytho mythological narrative of being able to freely project onto other people you know, a kind of scapegoat so that you can kind of give yourself wiggle room to do whatever rationalization that you want to do. It, it, it's a very disgusting form of moral debasement uh, that's premised in denigrating other people to a large extent. To uh, I, I can describe the psychological mechanism here, which is quite interesting, which is essentially, um, I've, I've spoken about it in other recordings, but essentially where as an individual you can indulge in envy and then you can kind of pass off your envy and disguise it as identity jealousy, because jealousy and envy are, are different words that have different meanings. And, and, and let me just delineate them clearly, at least the relevant salient point here is that envy is something that somebody else has that you want. And jealousy is something that you own that somebody else threatens to take away from you or that has taken from you. So you're jealous about the attention that your wife gives to somebody else is the classic sort of uh, example, perhaps, of, of, of what, something that you're jealous about. You're jealous about something that by all rights you have some claim to or some, let's say, native possession around or something like that. And so you're jealous about something that other people threaten to abscond. And you're envious about something that that properly belongs to somebody else or that does belong to somebody else. So 
what identity politics really is about is about indulging in envy as a source of self-esteem because one can narrate it as being an identitarian jealousy that that actually that was stolen from my identity so I can indulge in it I can indulge in the envy from an from an individual point of view and so it it creates this very unstable psychology and and even psychosis within the individual because essentially they they on the individual scale are indulging in in quite a lot of toxic envy but in the na- but then that's projected into a narrative of jealousy of historical cherry picked factoids that cr- that convolute and and conflate into this very simplistic world view in which essentially that's why the ends will justify the means that essentially that the ident- balance must be brought to the to the identitarian matrix or something like that and then you kind of get this this very d- disassociated unpragmatic you know just kind of loose mind garbage or whatever and you know it, it's it's very much like the 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 nazi philosophy it's very much like you know the them going on and on and on about the jewish conspiracy you know it, it, it everyone has to orientate themselves according to this narrative in order to be on the same page and it's it's very um you know and and you end up creating these terms and these phrases that that are really pathetic and stupid to work with like implicit bias like what what are you even talking about implicit bias you know just so that you can essentially import historical na- mythologies and narratives and project them onto the present when they really have i mean historically you could say that they have some kind of causative nexus and connection but they're morally it's an amoral amorphous projection it's not useful it, it, as if you you're trying to steal some kind of moral authority about history because you don't understand practicalities in the present in some sense because you want to override other people's judgment when you don't know even what's going through their head but you're projecting intentionality onto them and you know and this gets also into horrible sort of things because you've got the simplistic moral formula and equation in which you can hope to extract things because of that simplistic moralism and it has nothing to do with the price of anything it has nothing to do with with how anything functions uh you know um and so you end up uh compensating people for quite a toxic mentality in which they are literally that they have disempowered themselves and they have robbed themselves of genuine self confidence which they're not capable of actually attaining to because in some sense their only self confidence that they can kind of think that they can achieve is this fake self esteem that's built on envy which in some sense can only be justified if they can torture their scapegoat if they can really punish the out group you know and and the end of that is basically genocide and although that's probably not going to happen in america it's very much developing in south africa Th- this is this is the toxic politics that we have been infected with from this disgusting american proto fascism race and gender studies academia and this anti-rational anti-reason you know kind of ideological fascism it's very very dangerous poisonous stuff um and you know we suffer from it in this country we suffer from it because of of the political corruption and the political unaccountability and the never ending blah 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 because of the simplistic moralism and this ideological convenience of of the corrupt plutocrats kleptocratic political elite that that can make themselves tokens because that's how identity politics works is that you empower token and you get token power and you get symbolic power but everything just disintegrates and falls apart and then you just say well that needs to fall apart because we're we need to hurt our ideological enemies you know it's this this kind of zero sum sort of thing because you can't let go of the stupid moralism you can't get let go of these stupid convoluted conflated false dichotomies that are inbuilt within implicit bias anyway um because you don't have the discipline to not use those stupid terms because they seem too morally apt they seem too morally useful or something like that um because you just want to get to the means are justified by the ends or the means will be justified by the ends 
So that's really the, 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 the rotten moral worm that's in the thinking of this, which is essentially a very juvenile, sentimental sort of estimation that um, I want to be able to be a, 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 a moral philosopher, armchair critic, and I want to be able to say essentially, well, this doesn't look right, make it look right for me, from my moral armchair you know, my, my moral philosophy sitting in my armchair looking at this when I have nothing, I have no understanding about what actually happens on the ground in the name of these lofty so-called so moral appearances, the politics of appearance. Um, just because I can just sort of rubbish bin the whole of history and say that the whole of history is just sort of defective and therefore anything goes in correcting history as if such a thing is even possible to correct history. Um, you know, it, it's it's just this completely, anyway, um, this is the kind of moral laxity that, 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 that is impregnated in the American system because they don't have a concept of justification. They just have this kind of moral fiat, which is essentially in the image of the Napoleonic corruption, as it were, um, because you cannot explore in the court the substantive law in principle because they don't have principled substantive law, they only have principled due process and procedure. So this is why the American system is fundamentally poisonous, but it's also because it's, uh, King George was right, it was not time for America to claim its independence, it was too early, and they followed the French example. Anyway, anyway, um, look, you can't argue against history, it happened, but now you have a, con America deserves to have a constitutional crisis, because its legal structure is wanting to say the least and i've i've described it enough now but um okay let me just end this recording did i make the point that i wanted to make i was just trying to explore the notion that essentially that legitimate government purposes have to be justified and you can only do that when you have some kind of permanent fixture of the substantive law in a society it doesn't mean that there isn't a place for further regulation and promulgated structures and things like that. But they, they must be filtered by a core substantive element in the law, which is essentially what exists within the Roman Dutch substantive law as it was received by the Dutch in Christian Europe in some sense. Um, you know, so we've had all the horrible bits of Roman law has, has, been, ta has been taken out. Um, because they've, I mean, it, has, well, it hasn't been taken, but they, they, they don't get used, because essentially you can't become a slave anymore because you cannot stop being a legal subject. And also everyone is a legal subject. I mean, in, in the Roman system, only the heads of each rich household was a pater familius, was, was a real legal Roman subject. Now everyone is a legal subject, and you can't lose your legal subjectivity, which means that no one can be made a slave. So, I mean, that's that's how we fixed it. We've just basically added some things, is that everyone is a legal subject, and you can't lose your legal subjectivity, and you can't inherit debt. I mean, in the Roman system, you could inherit debt. In in the Christian Europe, they said, no, you can't inherit debt. So, you know, we've just, we, we, we've updated it with some common law, essentially. The social norms changed. The, essentially, it's the same Roman law with just updated social norms. And it doesn't exist anywhere in the world except for the legal tradition in South Africa, which has now been poisoned by this American legal scholarship, um, which is, you know, substandard. And, and you know, I guess, uh, and, and our judiciary was, was apt to, to copy their legal scholarship because it, ha it helped promote the political corruption that we have in this country. And it helped promote the betrayal of, of the South African constitution, which would have kept the new South Africa in check. It would have kept the new South Africa flourishing because we, we would have had real um, judicial instruments to combat against um, uh, against the kind of corruption and, and, and the kind of policy that is poisonous and that is prone to allowing for klep kleptocracy and tokenism because essentially, you know, the BEE, the black economic empowerment legislation is essentially wholesale corruption. Essentially, middlemen, politically connected middlemen, don't even make 
local production facilities, all they do is they import goods from overseas. I mean, this is this is the trope. They import goods from overseas and then they resell them according to the government tender and they just bank, they just make a whole lot of money and, and they've just funneled money into foreign manufacturing. You know, th th there's no, so you've just made one person very rich because they're politically connected. That's what BEE is in this country. It's, it's disgusting. And that's what you get when you have legislation that does not target disadvantage. You get quick, quick, ri get rich, quick schemes for the politically connected. And that's what the ANC government is essentially. And it, and it cannot be challenged because it's said to be a legitimate government purpose and it's rational. Because hypothetically, it might function. <laughs> hypothetically, it might function. Not in practice is it justified. <laughs> Not, you know, like you don't have to justify the actual policy. It's pathetic. And we get this because of how America is functions, essentially. And they're just and their stupid legal scholars came and thought that they could teach something to our judiciary who was just looking for an excuse to help facilitate um, the ANC corruption or because they themselves are, are affirmative action uh, uh, judiciary uh, uh, hires or, or, or whatever. I mean, this is why you need to have skilled people in, in certain places. Yes, the, the, the bench should reflect the, the, the population to some degree to legitimize, you know, it's very important that people can see themselves in the judiciary, but it should not be fast tracked. You, you, you cannot, I mean, well, this, this is, I guess, how corruption has set in institutionalized corruption from top to bottom. I mean, either these people are, they're, either they're incompetent or they are overtly corrupt. Um, or they're, you know, they're essentially, they're ANC. Uh, uh, cadre affiliates or something like that, or, or, or they're just ideologically, they're on board with this kind of racist, racialist, disgusting, you know, uh, uh, you know, legal positivism, the, the Napoleonic corruption, uh, they don't give a damn. They don't, they don't under, they never understood what was special about the South African legal structure. They never understood what was special about the South African, uh, uh, constitution and they were happy to betray it and betray its values. And these are people that if this country continues to deteriorate and if it eventually does end in calamity, these are the people that must be held accountable. They must be held in the docks and they must go through the Nuremberg trial like, like we went through the Nazi command after the Second World War. These are, these are the people that must be shoulder to shoulder, the academics, the race and gender studies academics, the, the, the radio hosts that pumped this vile filth, this anti-constitutional propaganda out, the, ju the judicial officers that gave lectures on this disgusting identity politics filth, all this racialist nonsense, and still Ramaphosa as well. But I mean, who knows, maybe he's a double agent because he's trying to, he's trying to play both sides in the political game until he can try to fix ANC politics. But who knows? I mean, there's so many mixed signals that, that come out of ANC politics. But essentially, that's what happens when you have a sp split prerogative or when you have a Congress within a parliament. You know, um, it's... Uh, You know, the, the political unaccountability is at such toxic levels. You know, the, 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 the irresponsibility of how the fiscus has been completely decimated by corrupt rule, by institutionalized corruption, but also by, I mean, I just bemoan the legal structure because the legal, the legal system in South Africa was special. It is the best legal system in the world. That is a big claim to make, and it is true. And we have essentially degenerated into the American constitutional crisis, which doesn't belong in our country because we actually have a constitution that works in principle, but it has been betrayed by our own judiciary. Um, and they should be damn well ashamed at their part in the corruption. But anyway, um, You know, they don't understand that equality is not a right, it's a practice. And you have to read Section 9 in connection with the limitations clause, the general limitations clause. And, and anyway, I've, I've put this in my other recordings. But uh, 
essentially, you know, the closest thing we have to the right of equality is that all laws must be laws of general application and people must have equal protection under the law. And so when you're looking at, at advancing one person's constitutional rights at the, at the detriment or the infringement of somebody else's constitutional rights, you really have to justify whatever policy is, is doing this or, or whatever legal test is doing this in terms of the cases of, of the A, B, C, D, E in the limitations clause, especially in terms of the fifth case, which is that are there less restrictive means to, to do the same, as it were, and also the importance of the right and the purpose of, of the limitation and all those sorts of things, and all, all those five cases. But essentially, those five cases are practical are practical things that, that are must... This is why equality is expressly... Um, spoken about in the limitations clause. And categories of persons in section 9, by the way, is categories of disadvantaged persons. It's not categories of people that might have disadvantage. And this is quite clear when we understand that everything must be a law of general application and people must have equal protection under the law. And, and, you know, essentially with, with, the, with the value of non-racialism and non-sexism and all the non-values, then you see that it doesn't matter that policy might, in its effect, impact people differently. Um, but it cannot target superficial features. It, it, must, it can't target based on things that violate the value of non-racialism. You cannot target racial racial beneficiaries or recipients of a policy. You have to target based on objective criteria, on laws of general application and equal protection under the law, according to the constitutional values, the prime constitutional values. I mean, it's so obvious. It's so simple. Um, you know, just read three things together. Just read section 9, section 36, and... Um, in the Bill of Rights and and read uh, uh, the values clauses. Um, very, very simple. 